for the fourth or fifth time, I don't even remember now, for joining. And uh, Yeah, me, I've lost track too. <laughs> but it's, it's always fun talking to you. I mean, there's a certain number of people that I talk to, and I'm sure the feeling is mutual on the other side too, that I truly enjoy. And it's really you know, lovely to always talk to you and learn from you about the stuff that you have done. So, oh, yeah. yeah, thank you. It's, it's nice because it's, um, it's rare that I do an interview with the same person more than once. <laughs> Well, I hope it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, awesome. Uh, so, yeah, so we're, we're going to talk about, you know, two films back and forth, but mainly, you know, you work with a director more than once several times. Um, yes. You know, this time, uh, Wolfgang Peterson, who directed uh, The Perfect Storm and uh, Air Force One, who has also directed the films that you weren't part of but just from a standpoint of from context das boot never ending story um you know some of the great stuff that he's done yeah. and uh just let, sort of starting off with how did you i think air force one was before perfect storm or was it the other way around yeah yes it was so how i mean obviously you had known about wolfgang peterson because oh, of yeah. his work right his lovely yeah. amazing work that he's done over the years how did you land on Air Force One, it was a traditional way of just shopping around and, you know, or he well, wanted it, you. It, I think it, it, it usually happens, unless I'm working with someone for the second time, I usually mm -hmm. then get contacted by them. But when I've never done it, I think what, what they do is they put out feelers to, if they're looking for an editor, they put out feelers to all the agencies that handle editors. Um, and it just so happened that um I I was working on the rock at the time. Mm -hmm. So um I got a call from my agent saying, you know, they, I'm going to send you a script. It's mm -hmm. Wolfgang Peterson, the director, and he's looking for an editor for this project. I read it mm -hmm. and I said, Yeah, I I want to do it. And then I get called in to see Wolfgang and we talk, talk about the project. I find most of the time when I go in for interviews for jobs. It's more a conversation, oh, more on a personal level. I mean, a little bit of talk about the film, but I, it, it's a bit of an interview going two ways, you know what I mean? You're interviewing that person as well, although they probably don't think you are. Yeah. Um, whether you want to work with that person and they're doing the same to you. And I think uh, if, is a, if a rapport is established during that that interview, you get, you get the job. Um, and I don't know how many, I'm sure a lot of other people were interviewed for that job. So I always, it was a period of my career, the the, the 90s, that um, I worked very constantly. A couple of times I overlapped, Perfect Storm was one of them. I overlapped the end of that film with The Green Mile. Um, and it was a period where I was doing a lot of good stuff. I was very lucky to get mm -hmm. involved. But it's more, it's sort of like a self fulfilling prophecy in a way I don't know if that's the correct term but once you get a job and it, it's successful you're you're on the radar of people who are looking for someone so then yeah. you, you you get that you're somewhere near the top of the list I, I would imagine because you're very visible your work is very visible it's out there so I went through that period during the the 90s and ending up with them it ended up kind of ended that run a very successful run uh, in you know 2000 and I'm very grateful for that period a lot of people don't get that kind of run that I got but I was lucky yeah you're you're so right about that because you know I I talking to people on this podcast and meeting some of them in person um I was just in LA and you know I met uh, uh the director of Kung Fu Panda John Stevenson one of the one of the directors and Kung Fu Panda was like a surprise box office hit. Like it was not beyond expectations. And I think he was nominated for even Oscar. And another director um, of Spirit Stallion of Cimarron, another animated film, she was nominated for Oscar, Lorna Cook. And you figure, you know, you go that to that level that there is going to be at least some much, somewhat more of, you know, going up and up before you go down. But for them, the career just went from there and then they were completely forgotten. And then they had a hard time, you know, finding work, which is, I think, a story of a lot of people oh, um, yeah, in, the, in the business. 
Yeah. I mean, I was lucky that in my career, I actually chose to end, you know, uh, to, to come back to Australia to just say, okay, had enough. Um, everyone's going to retire sometime. And um, I, I'd reached that point that I realised that it was it was getting harder and the, 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 the industry was getting very, very complicated too, you know. It mm. was... It was a lot more, there was a lot, lot more input from a lot of people into what they thought the film should be and mm-hmm. getting getting very political and, um, yeah. So yeah. You, 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 you decide to step away from it and go, that's it. I, I've, I had 54 years of working in this industry. So um, that was with my television background and the feature films. So I'm content you know couldn't yeah do, couldn't do any more <laughs> well that's that's a good thing that you're content because not again going back to something that you and i just both said not a lot of people get that you know uh kind of contention for a long time so yeah good to he- good to hear that and going back to what you said about the you know rapport part that is you know just so important because even like directors you know like nolan and Tarantino or you know even though they'll pick like big big actors but at the same time you know they still want to go out and have lunch with them or dinner with them just to talk about life and yeah. and then they'll see some spark that they may see or they may not see and they make that decision and I think you know even in a regular job I would say like you know a nine to five like whether it's whatever like a manager position I think people should sort of use that formula because that tells you more about a person than you know I, I get it, the qualifications need important too, but you should do that homework beforehand. If you have asked somebody to come in, instead of asking about their qualifications, ask them about their family life. What, what's that like? Because people like that stuff. Yeah, and you know, you're going to spend, from an editing editor's point of view, it comes down to sitting in a dark room with yeah. the director. It's just the two of you for most of the time, for yeah. you know months on end, and. You've got to be able to get on with that person. You've got to have you've got to have something that you know. I mean, and talking talking of Wolfgang, we had a fantastic working relationship. It was it was fun. I didn't dread going into work ever because I knew I had the protection also that he had director's cut. Very few directors have it anymore, and even back then in the nineties, not many people. Steven Spielberg had had it and. I suppose Robert Zemeckis had it and Clint Eastwood. But um, knowing that the studio was kept at arm's length, all their good intentions, you know, it really comes down to two people making the film in the end once it's been shot. And he wants to know that he's got someone who's got his back and I I know he's got my back. So Mm. we can just get on with doing the job. And not worry about all that is basically what I'm saying. So yeah. um, I want to be able to know that you've got. And we, we used to go out to lunch every day, and quite often there were times when I would pick him up from his house because he lived near me, and um, if he was having a car in service or something, something like that, um, and I'd drop him home, and we'd, we'd, um, you know, that's a rare thing to happen. Yeah, you know. And, I'd, it- I've been to his Certainly. house, had dinner at his house, been at dinner at restaurants with him. So um, that was a good working relationship. So so true. And as a human being, you know, we, you and I have talked about Michael Bay and, you know, uh, you know, he has a different kind of nature of do, dealing with things. As a human being, what was Wolfgang, what is working with Wolfgang like? Oh, it was it was great. You know, it was fun. I mean, every day was fun. He was also you knew where you when you were going to be working, and there were never any long hours. He he was mm. very Germanic about that. He would start at nine, he'd break for lunch at one, and he would end the day at six o'clock. And we had we got I've worked on films where that's not been a productive time, but it, that with him was a very productive time because he was focused and. There was never any, um, with all good directors, they're very focused about what they want to achieve. So there's not a lot of wishy-washiness, you know. Mm-hmm. It's either 
that's good or that's bad, and there was sort of nothing in the middle. You know, if if the scene wasn't working, it wasn't working, and that really didn't happen with with Wolfgang. Now he was so organised as a director, he um, it, it was never a problem. So it, that also made it fun and enjoyable, and he was telling jokes all the time, and it's just very very dry sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a, the funny he, part. he was he was also a cat person. He and his wife Maria had lots of cats that they had adopted, and had his house set up to accommodate them. You know, with I remember going to his house, and his fences had windows at the bottom of them to look out onto the street, so the cats could sit there and look out and see the the activities going by. And it oh, was, wow. they were they were protected from. From birds, by um, you know, the backyard was totally safe for them. Was had wires going across it to protect them from owls, I suppose, or anything like that, so they could be out in the wild. So very, um, very unusual. Right. I I became familiar with Wolfgang Peterson because of Never Ending Story. <clears throat> you know, as a as a kid, I think yeah. I was like. 13, 14 years old. And I think Never Ending Story came in 84 and I saw it in 1990 or 91. Um, and then I remember when Air Force One came out um, and I saw the name Wolfgang Peterson because I had seen Never Ending Story God knows how many times, like you know, one of my favorite childhood movies. And still, is it's a very classic film. Like if you watch it in terms of puppeteer work, visual effects, music, performances, um, and I saw the trailer of Air Force One, and I, I won't lie to you, when I saw it, I'm like, what? how is the concept of a movie where the president of the United States is, like, fighting the terrorists? Like, that did not, I was, I think, 19 or 20 at the time, and that did not sync with me. It just did not, the the trailer did not sync with me. But when I, it's funny, at both these movies have... I have a very weird relationship with them when they came out. And now in hindsight, I'm like, what was I thinking? And then <laughs> I saw the, and then I saw the film and I really, really liked it. Like Harrison Ford really worked in the film as the president, but in the trailer, it didn't appeal to me. Oh, and, really? How interesting. Yeah. I know it was so weird. Like in the trailer, I'm like, this is Indiana Jones. Like, how is he, you know, I think that was the, in the psyche that, how can he be the president of the United States and then beating up terrorists? Because in the trailer, and I think it's, they also show up a lot of scenes where he's actually, you know, the vulnerability is not shown in the trailer, if my memory serves me right. Uh, but in the film, there is. Like, there's, you know, a lot of stuff that he's shown like a, because a character gets developed. Um, and in The Perfect Storm, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, I went to see it. And around that time, I think it was, I was into very, like, fast-paced films. And uh, I walked out. I left the movie theater. <laughs> and wasn't fast and the, enough for you. No, but you know what? The funny thing is, 12 years later, I started working on a documentary that was about a fishing community. So I saw the film again while I was working on that just to give me some sort of a, you know, a perspective of how the fishing communities work. I mean, that was like a bigger one, the one compared to what I was working. And I totally loved it. And I, I saw it again two days ago and I related to it so much because I spent so much time in the fish in that fishing village that I made the film right. on. Like I, I spent about six months over the course of four years and it was it was such a marvelous film to watch. And it's just funny how times change your views on certain things. I just wanted to share that. I mean, it, it, and That's the pacing funny. and the pacing of Perfect Storm was absolutely perfect. Now that I you know saw it two days ago, it made complete sense to me. And it didn't when I was when I was young uh, and I loved both of the films more perfect storm than air force one, because it was obviously a true story and it was more realistic to me than right. air force. One. Yeah. yeah. Air Force, And I don't think air force one would have worked without Harrison in it. You know, I don't know if anybody You're else right. could have carry, carry yeah. that off. The, the disappointing thing about air force one, it was quite early days with visual effects and CGI, especially. And yeah. there's some pretty atrocious, CGI. I mean, some good ones for the time. The fighter jet stuff was good, but the um, the Air Force One itself, especially the crashing, is just just you know not up to today's standards, shall we say? 
Hundred percent. But it is funny. I think if you show it to a, today's generation, um, like you know, a boy or a girl, they will probably say that. But if you have sort of lived in that time, you kind of let it go. Like you know, special effects weren't really up to par, so it's okay. Mm, right. Um, but it was it was a very engaging film. Like I think I think it, honestly, it wasn't just Harrison Ford. I think Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman both made that oh, film Oldman, the, yeah. the way it was. I mean, they were just perfect opposites of each other. Yeah, Gary Oldman was amazing, amazing. Yeah, no, he was working on Air Force One. Um, what were if you? I know it's been a long time. Whatever you can remember, whether it's a challenge or an anecdote or something that got cut that you, both you and Wolfgang felt that should have been there, but you had to because of you know time constraints or the pacing. What was well, I yeah, I don't think there was anything cut. I can remember um, uh, the, the visual effects on the Air Force One um, were like a step up, quite a few steps up from from Air Force One. And I do remember Wolfgang was all really saying at the start of, even before production, that because we were all disappointed in the, the water effects that were CG in mm -hmm. um, Perfect Storm. Uh, sorry, it's the other way around. Yeah, other way around. Sorry, that story doesn't make sense now. Um, we're talking about what are we? Which one we're we talking about? So Air Force One. I think Air Force you, you One. Might, yeah. Yeah. No, there was nothing that. No, I don't think there was. It was just the challenge. The real challenge of the um, of the visual effects was. Um, I don't recall us having any real issues like that again because Wolfgang was so organized the script was so organized and so I mean I've worked on films where there's no ending or there's no beginning to the to the script mm -hmm. and that's all worked out as we go along which is not the way to make a movie but Wolfgang's films weren't like that all his stories like he didn't start shooting a, 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 a script till it was ready to, so we could concentrate on just doing that work instead of having to work on rewriting. There was no real rewriting done while that film was being made. It's pretty much this: the script was shot that, that was written. But mm. um, no, there was nothing. There was nothing like that. It was all very smooth sailing. Got you. I mean, there were and always the complications of the 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 budget and trying to keep the. Um, the visual effects to a minimum and they did so much of the storm footage in a tank in a sound stage at warner brothers in burbank and the full-size trawler in there and dump tanks for the waves and what what most films do in those situations they put green screen outside the windows and add the water later well mm -hmm. to make it work what what we did, what we had was a backing out there, you know, which is a, a painted background of just like indistinguishable greys, different shades of grey. And because it's out of focus, you can't tell if it's a wave mm -hmm. because the focus is in the foreground on the actors. And with water going by, we got a, got away with a lot of stuff that people, people I'm sure if they watch it would not have would not recognize that there's like nothing really happening out that window. There's no waves. There's only yeah. only for the hero shots that you, did you do that? Like looking through the front of the the um, the, the boat through the front windows, seeing the waves in front. That was obviously CG. Right. Yeah, one thing I I I. I... Picked up on Perfect Storm when I saw it two days ago. No, I I, I don't know if Wolfgang had any kind of um, um, intention doing that or if it, it was it really happened in the true story. The shark when it comes on the boat, you know, to me that reminded me of the ending of Jaws, like the moment that happened, you know, Robert Shaw's character sort right. of dragging out, and I thought I thought that was I mean it just it just kind of you know triggered that memory. But one thing that I really uh, felt I, I don't know I, I know you're saying the visual effects weren't up to par in both films especially with Air Force One I thought with Perfect Storm just watching it two days ago I mean I I didn't like with the exception of few shots I even thought there was a sequence of 
uh, a cargo ship where the cargo kind of just falls in. Right. Water. Yeah. Well, that was all you know, obviously all CG. Yes, yeah. No, but it, it, it looked real. It looked pretty yeah. good. Well, I think also we had the Air Force One, the visual effects were mainly done by a visual effects house called Boss Films. Ah. Uh... Perfect Storm was done totally ILM. by ILM. So there's yeah. a huge step up there. Also, a few years and, a, and digital effects improved a lot over a couple of years. And Wolf, Wolfgang, and this was a story I was trying to tell before. Now we've got it in the right order. Wolfgang really had to, he got visual effects people to, to show him and to prove that, that they could do digital water convincingly before he would commit to do the film because he said, I'm not, there's so much water in this film. Yeah. If it doesn't look real, it's not going to work. And um, I think that was basically a a product or a byproduct of how bad some of the visual effects, especially the in Air Force One, the plane crashing into the ocean. The water looked terrible. The plane looked terrible, but mainly the water. And we had lots of lots of meetings and, I think what helped a lot with the, the the reality of the visual effects is the cinematographer, John Seal, was a, I don't know if he still is, a very keen sailor. So he understood the way water should look. And we'd have meetings all the time with um, visual effects. Would, there's a big hero shot of the boat going up the face of the wave and the water coming over the top. And it's it's foamy and cresting and... And it just so many attempts to get that looking more realistic because in, what the visual effects people, unless they know water, um, they don't understand there's certain subtleties to the way water looks. Yeah. John was able to point that out. Like the water comes off the top of the wave. When it's coming off the top of the wave, it's really very misty and thin. And we're saying, oh, it's too chunky. It's just, you know, it's not looking real. So a lot of that was, um, I think, what made made it look made the the attention to detail coming from people outside of the visual effects department helped to make it look really good so yeah i think it would does still stand up yeah i i noticed one thing um it wasn't anything massive but again having because when, when i made my um film only 78 about the fishing community we actually went on a boat and to get get some footage of these fishermen, you know, catching lobster and different fish, and I thought it was going to be a walk in the park, right? Uh, <laughs> silly me. Uh, and uh, it it wasn't even that bad in terms of the weather, but still, you know, you the boat will rock up and down. And one thing I noticed with Perfect Storm, there's a scene when uh, George Clooney's character is saying that there's a big storm coming. Either we have a choice to wait it out and let you know the fish rot or we go through the storm and then the camera is on the other four guys mark Wahlberg, and um and you can see that because the ship i mean you could see it was a real ship and they were really out there it will go rock up and down you'll see the water come up behind them and down and that to and that's not an easy thing to film like it being on the boat whether it's a small crew or a big crew it's not an easy thing to do. It's very, very challenging. I mean, Spielberg has talked about that with Jaws uh, over and over again. Uh, filming yeah. on water is not easy, even if it's on soundstage. Well, it's not easy. Actually, yeah, speaking of Jaws, I know that you watch that film and you can see the difficulty with shooting on water from one shot to another. The, the, sea, the sea level, the sea quality of the water changes from being quite smooth to be little waves and yeah. but it, you get so you get so wrapped up in the story you you should only be looking at those things if the movie's not working that's what i find exactly. myself doing you know if i'm watching a movie and i'm watching the editing um i know um the films lost me yeah well i mean i think with jaws it's an exception because i think a lot of us have seen it so many times that we start picking up on these little things yeah. uh you know but after we have sort of run out of the uh, the main story and admiring it and everything but but you know uh, the story of andrea gale um it's uh, there's actually even an episode of seinfeld about it i don't know if you remember this oh really uh, 
Yeah, it was actually, it was, it was, you know, Seinfeld, have you seen it quite a bit? Or? Oh, absolutely. I thought I'd seen every okay. episode, but so um, there's I don't remember that one. There is an episode, I think it was Andrea Gale, I could be wrong. There was an episode with George Costanza who wants to get an apartment and he has to come up with a story to fight out the competitor and he comes up with the story that he was part of this shipwreck or uh, I think it was Andrea Gale and I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure and he he basically tries to win over the tenants and everything and and when I, I was watching the film like oh Andrea Gale uh, that makes sense uh, <laughs> but it's it's such a it's such a I, I wonder how it became such a big story because not that it shouldn't be because it was about a you know a fishing community and like how how did that story in from what you understand became so big uh, as I opposed to like because Titanic of the, well because of the book um that oh, okay uh, there was a book written uh, I, I didn't know that the, yeah there was a book written about it so i think the event was fairly unknown until the book was written sebastian younger i think his name is Young, you know, younger. He wrote the story. Funny thing, a funny story about that though. We were on the soundstage mix doing the final mix of Air Force One, and one of the the sound mixers on on the on the crew handed this book to Wolfgang, The Perfect mm. Storm, and said, "You know, you might be interested. This is the kind of thing that you should be doing, Wolfgang." And lo and behold, he read it. The next thing I know, he's going to turn it into a movie. Funny how things happen. I don't think he would have picked it up himself, but um, yeah, interesting. And he was looking for something like a big drama on the water to do. I think that was something he wanted to do. Um, it's a hard, it's a big challenge to take on doing a movies on the water. I've done one yeah. of those. They're, they're difficult. Well, he did Das Boot, right? And I think that was. More yeah, popular that probably... in Ger Germany than in Hollywood, so I think that's why you mm. probably want to do something similar. I think he wanted to do his his version of Titanic. I was going to say that too, <laughs> because he was a real, he was a real fan of Titanic. He was blown away by that. I think, we, like most people, were because there was so much involved around the production of that film, the troubled production, yeah, and um, cost overruns and everything. And I don't think people were expecting it to be as good as it was. It's crazy but, how but, that film. Yeah, sorry, go on. Certainly, Wolfgang wasn't. He went to see it because that was being made at the same time we were doing Air Force One. Right. So there was a lot of um, there was a lot in the press about it, about the problems of it, and we were following it. I think they actually had a section in Hollywood Reporter or Variety called Titanic Watch, and every day they would they would have a little article about the latest goings on on the set. <laughs> so that was, you know, we, you, you, you're primed to think that there's going to be a terrible movie. So when it turns out to be very good and very yeah. successful. Well, I, I remember speaking of Titanic, it was supposed to come out July 2nd, 1997. And then, and that was the same day Men in Black came out with Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. Right. And then it postponed until December 18th. And I even remember. You know, like if you think about it, even looking at the original trailer, not the, you know, uh, revised trailer or the re-release trailer, you see everything in the trailer, right? Even to the moment, the last shot or last scene, I would say, one of the last scenes where the ship goes down with Leo and Kate on the top. And you figure, and now you look at it, like how the hell did this movie made so much money with everything in the trailer, and everybody knew about the story too. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, it's, well, maybe <laughs> that's that's why you know, you want. I think they went along with uh, for the curiosity of it, yeah. And um, like most people did, and um, well, obviously the story, the love story, is what yeah, of course, what yeah. got them in. Yeah, I mean it was really popular. I remember when I used to, I was in my first year of university. It was like, you know, Leo was the big thing for all the students, the girls, and everything. Like everybody wanted to watch that movie. I I. It's just amazing how those things work. But coming back to, you know, Perfect Storm, in the past, you've talked about being on the uh, set most of the times and cutting. And was it similar for you with Perfect Storm um, yeah. doing so? So were yeah, you in was, the actual community in, in Massachusetts? I, I didn't go on location because they weren't actually on location for that long. Most of mm. 
most of the rest of the shooting was done uh, on the soundstage. And mm -hmm. um, um, so, yeah, and I was on the lot at Warner Brothers cutting and Wolfgang would call me to the set quite often because he wanted to explain to me something that he had um, had he, that he had shot and uh, what his intentions were to ha how to put it together and and I would do my other thing where there was also a second unit working you know shooting a lot of the um, inserts like right one particular insert that and they would come up to the to the cutting room all the time to 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 see how the main unit had shot the scene. Mm -hmm. And they needed to see it cut together. And then if they needed an insert, how they were going to do it. So you need to be around. You need to be up with the footage behind them, up to camera, as they call it. And mm -hmm. um, I remember one particular um, insert that they shot was a hook going into the guy's hand before he, and then he gets pulled over. Well, mm -hmm. it's a very quick action. You know, it's, it's, it's literally boom, boom. It's, it's, hook into the hand and he's gone. And they shot it so many times because, and I think I tried every take until I found one that was just the right speed that you could actually see what was going on, that your eye didn't miss anything because it was literally hook in yep. and then the hand moved. So you didn't want hook, then it go. You want hook, go at the same time. But so many of them were the right speed, but the camera, the hook wasn't in the right position. When you're doing something like that, a big close up, you need it to be right dead smack in the middle of the screen. The yeah. audience doesn't will need to do any kind of looking across to in the, on the big screen to another side of the frame to see a bit of action that's necessary to see. You need to, you don't want them to have to do any work, they got to see it. So, I remember I must have tried it, I don't know, 30 times each take to find that the one, the one that worked, but that that's the kind of thing they would do all the time second unit would always come up to the cutting room and look at, at inserts like the hel helicopter crash into the sea, you know, like yeah. all the little inserts that you needed to make that work, hands on, on the controls and gauges and all that. So main unit doesn't usually stick around to do that. That's too time consuming. Right. And I think with also that scene that you're talking about, with a, with a shot that's really fast, really quick and a close-up, there's also motion blur, right? Like it will... Yeah. It will it will move so fast that you can't even make it because it's it becomes blurry. So, so yeah, you, you I mean, had to no, find one which had because you really only need well, uh, from, from I found this out from experience on another film to actually see something you need only one frame out of twenty five per second to really, really yeah it's a difference between one one or two frames it's not very much but as you say you want one that's not blurred yeah. But the eyes are see it, otherwise it's just a blur. It's very, right. it's very interesting. Which film did you, and not trying to put one over the other, did you have better time working on um, Air Force One or Perfect Storm with Wolfgang? I mean, for me, I would guess it's Perfect Storm because the second one you build a rapport, but still yeah. I would love to know what you... Yeah, I, I don't know if there was any... the. I think it was probably a more a more difficult film to do. Uh, Perfect mm -hmm. film it was more mm. challenging, um, but Air Force One was you know mostly mostly shot on the soundstage in in the um, mock up of the Air Force One. So uh, that was a fairly controlled shoot. So, um, but you know, as I say, the key key to it all was Wolfgang. He always made it fun. I mean, he would come, if he came to this, I remember on Air Force One, he would come up to the cutting room during a break in shooting to either look at something or to talk to me about something. And this is an example of his sense of humour. He would walk into the cutting cutting room and at the top of his voice, he would yell out, everybody look busy. Because <laughs> <laughs> he knew people yeah, were sitting around reading books. and But he was just playing with, having fun. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I I said that two days ago on a set. Everybody needs to look busy, even if you're not busy. Because if, if especially in some cases, like you know, it's your it's your own production. But if there's another producer attached or something else, like you want to show them that you're even if you're done with the work, you 
Because yeah. they're paying you, right? You wanna you wanna show that you're busy and just doing something and, and even pretend you're rolling. Like I, I remember, you know, sometimes we're making a doc and a scene is like like it's one of those natural meetings or you know, conversation between people. And the DP would look to me and I'll be like, just cut it, but pretend like we have a signal, like cut it, but go like, you know, cut it, but pretend <laughs> that you're still going. And then we'll pretend we're filming. And um, yeah, it, it's just something you have to do. It's just the nature of business sometimes. Um, with Wolfgang, did you work on Outbreak too? or? No, I didn't. No, no I, I didn't. Um, yeah. No. Yeah, I wasn't too crazy about that film, especially the last act. Um, it was great yeah, up until yeah, the last. Yeah, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't one of his better ones. I, I liked the, his. I liked um, uh, Shattered. I thought that was very good. Remember, did you see Shattered? It sounds so familiar. Is that the poster with the mirror breaking and the woman's eyes? Uh, I think so. It was. Um, it was a a thriller. Yes, yes. It's been a long time. I gotta see it again with the. Uh, What's their name? Bob Hoskins, late Bob Hoskins, and Tom uh, Berenger. Oh, I gotta see yeah. it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's been a it's been a while since I've seen. That. I mean, he's done some great stuff, and I I didn't even realize this until like a week ago that he passed away last year. Yeah, very sad. Yeah, were you in touch with him? Like after? Not, no, not. No. He used to live near where I lived in the states. So I'd see him around, and um, no, we didn't. He asked me to do um, after Perfect Storm. Uh, he asked me to do um, what was it called? The, the other, the ship movie, the remake uh, that he oh, did. Po po Poseidon. Poseidon. Yeah. Poseidon. Uh, yeah, but was I was already movie, committed. But... I was already committed to another film, and probably a good one to miss. That one didn't work out either. Um, I mean, it, from a standpoint of technicality, it was really, really well done. Like especially the yeah. ballroom and everything. Um, he also did Troy. Yeah, uh, which... I, yeah. And I, he wanted me to do that too, but because it was shot in in England or somewhere, they had to have they had to have all the English crew by then, or heads of department all had to be English. Yeah. But I think it's one of his better movies also than in the Line of Fire with John Malkovich and Clint Eastwood. Yes. That that was a yes. great film. No, that that was great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the best one. For sure. And you know, just out of curiosity, I know it, it's tough in life, you know, people move on to certain things. Do you remain in touch with anybody from the film business even if it's one or two individuals that that even if you worked with them once or many, many times, or just kind of life just takes you on a different path and everybody just does their own thing? I mean, um, crew wise, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm good, good friends with John Seal, um, work with mm. him a lot. Um, and of course, my, my assistant who I used to have over in America, who I had for 20 years, um, she did a lot, all those films with me, uh, keep in touch with her. Um, but no, not really. I think a lot of, um, well, to be honest, a lot of them are not making movies anymore. The ones I've worked with, either either have passed away or, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just so a, it's a, it's a funny business. Who's Her name your is sister? Jennifer, Jennifer Mangan, Jennifer Spinelli. To however you want to look at it, sometimes she calls her. I think um, professionally, she's Jennifer Mangan. Hmm. Is she an editor now, full time? No, she's a, an assistant. America oh, is a great place. Okay. Yes, it's a great place for people who just want to be a specialist. Like in Australia, I mean, everybody, I think everybody wants to be, an, if they're an assistant, they want to be an editor. But in America, there are some assistants just want to be professional first assistants because it's a very responsible job. Mm -hmm. I mean, they run, they run the cutting room and I just waltz in and do my thing. Um, sit down, close the door, don't get bothered, and get on with it. And then all the interference is all done outside, all the running interference on all the people coming to ask questions. And I mean, it, it's a, to have a good assistant, a good first assistant is, is like vital. You know, mm. you don't want to be worried about, you know, do we have enough 
<laughs> stationary or anything like that. You don't want people bothering you with that, those questions. Yeah. You know? So yeah, I mean, I worked with her for 20 years. First film was The Rock. Okay, so your relationship with her started in The Rock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which yeah. was my first film cutting on Avid too. So and she was an experienced Avid assistant, which weren't there weren't hardly any in the film industry mm -hmm. at that stage. And she was a film assistant and a Avid assistant. In those days, in those early days, you'd have your film crew and your avid crew because they, they yeah. didn't know each other's job it was a really difficult and i lucked out and got somebody who knew it of both so so um yeah the rest is history as they say yeah actually speaking of avid i was talking to the um what was their names they, they edited um i'm really bad with names they edited the recent transformers movie um, and I've done a lot of other stuff with Michael Bay too. What I'm just gonna pull that up right now. Um, their names. Um, oh yeah, William uh, Goldenberg and Joel uh, Negron. I would presume that's how to pronounce it. And and we were talking about Avid, and you know how that you you're talking about Avid came in the time when you were working on The Rock, and it, there was that transformation. And we were talking about how now, well, Avid just got bought out by another company. They had to sell it. I, I don't remember the name of the company. Oh, and really? now and now the big software, which is actually an Australian-based company, uh, DaVinci Resolve. And oh, how it's, I didn't know that. Yeah. DaVinci Resolve, what is what is that? Done? I mean, Avid is still being used by a lot of studios, for sure. Um, but there are some films that are being cut on DaVinci Resolve because of its um, uh, element of grading and editing and visual effects and sound all in one go. And it's more popular with independent filmmakers because it's only $230 or something. And then there's a free version, which has only like few features that are not in the purchase version, but a lot of studios. Um, is, is, I mean, is, they... is that price, do you own it if for that or you rent it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no, it's just ownership, complete ownership. Yeah, Absolutely. well, see, that's a big thing because Avid charge you like a, a monthly fee, I think, which is. Yep, a yearly or monthly. It's the same thing with Adobe. They do the same yeah. thing. It's And, mm. uh, and yeah. And I mean, DaVinci was really popular with grading anyways, like, you know, the big. Yeah, so, so that's a, what I remember yeah. before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But now it's um, it's just a software which you can download for free and you can edit, grade, do sound, do special effects. Um, I was on Final Cut once uh, from version two. Then when Final Cut 10 came out, I dumped that and I went to Adobe and I started working on Avid for a bit. And now I'm completely DaVinci. I mean, I'll do Avid if there is a project that comes at requirement, but DaVinci is like just become one of those things where... It's it's just easier to use and plus it's cost effective. You don't have to worry about the monthly fee. Sounds sounds much better. Yeah, yeah. Um and you know, just kind of to wrap it up, one thing that I always find uh, fascinating with, you know, in whether you're a director or whether you're editor or whether you're a cinematographer. Not that there's a competition between you and another editor or at, and a set of ed editors, but there's also a community, right? Like you know, you're 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 talking to each other about different projects and stuff. Yeah. Um. Who? Well, who were some of the editors that you were close to in a sense of you know talking about films and learning from each other and having spent spending time with each other? I I don't know. I was I pretty much separated my work and my professional life. You know, Good. I, I didn't. Um, I mean, I would, I would mix with my, my peers from time to time, but nobody, nobody in particular. You know, um, I knew a lot of, I knew a lot of editors, but it was just on a friendly basis. I didn't mm. socialize with them. I had my own social set outside of the the office, um, and my my family, and uh, so no, I didn't. I think, generally speaking. I mean, there's there's the ACE in American Cinema Editors, which is the there's a lot of social stuff involved with that, and the Academy. If you're in the Academy, there's a lot mm -hmm. of people with that too, that you can. But I'm very much um, a lot of editors outside of the cutting room are also very um, 
shall we say, loners. Introvert. I mean, the whole the whole job is such a, such a loner yeah. job, sitting by yourself in a room for so many hours a day. And that's just us. I don't know if we're a very gregarious group. We get together from time to time in a big group, but um, no, not really. No, you're you're so right about that because I I've been in that editing position for a while, and you know it's it's a very lonely job, absolutely. Um, and depending on what you're working on, if it's something really dramatic and serious, then it becomes even worse because. If you're dealing with a very serious subject, and somehow it you know has an effect on your psyche and your mental health, then you're completely in the, in another zone. Uh, but it it yeah. is really it's funny it's funny you mentioned that because I probably speak to more DPs and directors on this podcast than editors because a lot of editors I've spoken to yourself um, uh, and few others, maybe with the exception of one or two, including yourself. They're, they're, you know, they're obviously because they're spending so much time alone. They're, they're introverts. Editors mainly yeah, yeah. are I think introverts. We, I think generally speaking, we are. But there are those ones who like to get together and go and have drinks. I've just never been that kind of um, person. I don't, I don't drink. I don't drink at all. So good anymore. <laughs> I don't uh, see the benefit. No, that's that that that's. Uh... That's I mean, if, a if, good choice. I, I usually find that if I'm working on a studio a lot, I'll bump into a lot of editors I know. Um, we may have lunch time to time. Yeah. Or, you know, but um, it's not that I'm totally opposed to having, you know, right. friendships, but it's just not the way my life works. Has the, I know with Spielberg, he's always had Michael Kahn, you know, from the very beginning, um, after Werner Fields, after Jaws. Uh, yeah. With Robert Zemeckis or any other director like James Cameron, was there ever a possibility of you working on any of their films that it ever even Not that happened? I knew of. If there yeah. was, I never knew of. I mean, I did meet Spielberg once, which was a great meeting. Came to the cutting room on Numb. Oh, how, no. What was your meeting like that with him? Was, was it during an editing session? Well, I was or? doing, I was doing, I was, do, I was editing The Green Mile. And Frank okay. Darabont knew knew him, knew him, right. and um, the, uh, we were on the Hollywood, the Warner Hollywood lot, which is now just called the lot, I think. Mm -hmm. In and um, he went to lunch with Spielberg on the lot, but then after lunch, he Frank came back in to the cutting room and said, "There's someone here who wants to speak to you." And he walked, stepped aside, and Steven Spielberg was standing behind him, oh, and wow. so he. He said, "Oh yeah, I was having Frank lunch with lunch with Frank, and I he, he just said I want to go and meet your editor, which was nice. So we had a nice chat for a while, just the two of us, one on one. One of the rare ones I've had it. I've actually had been able to sit down and talk to one on one. We talked. To, I talked about Avid and saying, you know, um, you should get onto this. This is really good. He said, Oh, Mike likes to use." <laughs> you know, the, it's been good for us to use just the regular film, so we're going to stick with that. I said, "Oh, okay," but you know, you can do versions of scenes, and but he wasn't convinced. But now so Michael then, but does do it on my Avid. Well, I think he he has to now. No, he has like no choice. <laughs> 90, 90 something. He's so he's very old. Yeah, no, I, I he rarely does any interviews, um, and but he has an assistant. Who's been working with him for a while? Um, I think her name is Sarah something, and she's done a lot of pieces in the films. That like I think she specifically just works with him and Spielberg. Um, but yeah, now he's he's got an assistant now who's you know probably doing more of the legwork. But you know, yeah, Michael I'm Michael sure. Kahn being Michael Kahn being Michael Kahn, right? Like it, his his name needs to go up there, just like Yunus Kaminsky and you know uh, other other individuals that work with Spielberg. Um, but yeah, no, this has been um, great. If there was one last thing I would ask you, I mean, you, you've talked about them a little bit. If there was one moment of memory that you would remember that stands out the first time I ask you from Air Force One or uh, Perfect Storm, what would that be uh, of your involvement in it in the post? It could be anything. It doesn't even have to be like, you know, about the film. It could be just an anecdotal if moment or 
any conversation with somebody on the set on the on the, on the post production side? Well, I, I I just know there's uh, always something that's stuck in my main, mind with with Wolfgang was when I would cut an action scene. Mm. If he if he said if he wanted it speed it up, you know, like he would say, "Can you just give it a a little haircut? Just just little here, little there." And I'd say, "Well, okay, go away, and, uh, and I'll just I'll fiddle with it." So he basically wanted like um, the one that he. Uh, the first time he used that saying was the scene where Harrison Ford and J- B- Gary Oldman are fighting at the back of the plane. Right. The, the get the get off your plane, get off my plane yeah, scene. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'd cut it. I thought it was pretty good, but he wanted it faster. So just give it a little haircut. I thought that was, <laughs> that, was that was always his 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 way of um, saying speed it up. And and it sure did. I mean, I think again with air force one it starts off with you know his speech as the president it sets up the film really really well i mean it had a huge cast i just remember glenn close when it was in it yeah um, she played the president of the united yeah, states yeah and um and there are a few other big names that i can't remember but same and that and there the beauty of both those films were they were complete opposite of each other one was about this the most powerful man in the world being vulnerable and the other was an average man in America, the fishing community, and how they deal with something really, really massive. So it, it's it's an interesting just to, you know the it, it's just interesting that those two films came out around the same time and they're completely opposite yet they're not about yeah. from each other. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I like about working with directors like Wolfgang is that you're not going to go in there and do a Transformers 16 or something, you know. <laughs> Every film is going to be different. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, I think the only films I've worked on which were the same film, basically, were the Fifty Shades that I did right at the end of my career. Yeah. So, um, yeah, apart from that, everything is different, isn't it? And, I mean, Green Mile and... Shawshank. And, um, or saying it's same era, but and both in prisons, yeah, but they're different stories, you know. Yeah. So yeah, no. So it, it's true, and I'm. I mean, it's funny you mentioned about Transformers sixteen, right? How many Harry Potter movies are there? Seven, I think, or Seven. eight. Yeah. Yeah, and no, you only did one, the first one yeah. with Chris Columbus. He wanted me to do yeah. the second one, but I spent too much time away from home in London, year yeah. uh, over a year. Although my wife was with me, but we were just like enough already of the English weather. <laughs> it, really, it was like terrible. <laughs> Rain, raining all the time. <laughs> Rain, nice thank you so to much. You. See you. Likewise, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. And do come back for another episode. Until then... Have a great day.